Hello, Dave.
call the meeting to order uh, the Standing Committee on Social Development um, on homeless. Oh, the sorry, the homelessness roadmap report. Um, and presentation from uh, Mayor Mark Hike, Minister Abernathy, and Ms. Minister Cochran. Um, so we'd like to welcome you, uh, and it is a public meeting. Um, at this point in time, we'll open the meeting. We'll ask Ms. Uh, Green to open up with a prayer, please. Thank you. God of power and might, wisdom and justice, through, your through you authority is rightly administered. Laws are enacted and judgment is decreed. Assist us with your spirit of counsel and fortitude. May we always seek the ways of righteousness, justice, and mercy. Grant that we may be enabled by your powerful protection to lead our territory with honesty and integrity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, before we start, uh, I'll get uh, our members to introduce themselves. I'll start with Mr. Blake. And Good afternoon, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Welcome. Good afternoon, Tom Bully, MLA for Tunida and Willoughby. Good afternoon, Danny McNeely, Satu Region. Michael Nadley, MLA for Detro. Julie Green, Yellow Knife Center. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Shane Thompson, the Handy, I'm the Chair of the Social Development. On my left is Megan Welsh, uh, she's our research. And on my right is the charity, is the clerk of our committee. Um, at this point in time, um, well, I guess should just so we have an adoption of the agenda moved by Mr. Bolio. Uh, all in favor with it? Thank you. And opposed? All right. Uh, any declaration of conflict of interest at this point in time? No. Uh, at this point in time, Mr. Cochran, uh, I turn the floor over to, your, to you, and then we'll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll begin with opening comments, but also Mayor Hike and uh, Minister Abernathy also have comments, so we'll just take turns if you're all right with that. Um, good. So again, uh, I'm pleased to be here with Minister Abernathy and Mayor Hike to discuss ideas on how to tackle the difficult problem of homelessness in Yellowknife. I'm also here with the President and CEO of the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation, Mr. Tom Williams, who will be delivering a short summary presentation on the roadmap report. I also want to acknowledge Ms. Debbie Delancey, over here, Deputy Minister of Health and Social Services. It was clear during this year's forum in the summer that to address homelessness, we need to draw on the expertise and support of numerous sectors, institutions, and agencies to develop coordinated solutions. The Roadmap Working Group, a diverse representation of government, non-government organizations, and private industry, was tasked with assembling the options presented at the forum this April and translating these ideas into an action plan to address homelessness in Yellowknife. From this report, you will see 11 actions recommended by the Roadmap, Roadmap Working Group. I respect the work that was done to develop the Roadmap Recommendations Report. Now, all the stakeholders need to, to give some thorough con consideration on the resources available to implement these solutions. I took a moment, excuse me, to put on my glasses because I struggle reading without them. <laughs> we have already made some progress on a few of the high priority actions, namely working with Shell to construct semi-independent units within their unused spaces, support for housing first, extending the shelter hours of the Safe Harbor Day Shelter, planning for a safety outreach and sobering center model, and examining a managed alcohol program. As Minister responsible for homelessness, I am fully committed to our work in these areas. Those that know my previous experiences working with homelessness know that I, do, I will do all that I can to reduce and address the causes of homelessness. I look forward and I'm working towards a vision where one day we can celebrate that everyone in Yellowknife has the housing and services required to be supported in their life circumstances. No one party can address homelessness. Preventing and solving homelessness requires a 
systemic community approach. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll turn it over to my right, Mr. Mark Hike. Who uh, will sorry, Mr. Cochran, actually. Oh, absolutely. So, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Uh, <laughs> Protocol. <laughs> Mr. Amir Hike. Thank you very much. I'll uh, I'll try to be brief so that we can uh, reserve the time that we have for for uh, discussing the the meat of the recommendations in the report. Um, but I just wanted to begin by expressing my gratitude for the leadership that. Uh, the Assembly and its members have shown on this issue uh, here in Yellowknife over the past year. Uh, certainly Minister Cochran and Minister Abernathy have uh, taken a very serious leadership role in this work, uh, but we've seen support from MLAs and not only from Yellowknife but from, from every region of the Northwest Territories to, uh, to start to address the issues around homelessness, mental health and addictions in, in Yellowknife and on Yellowknife streets. Uh, so the, the leadership that was shown resulted in the, the forum mentioned by Minister Cochran. It was a, a very uh, a good opportunity to bring together all stakeholders, something that happens all too rarely, I find, uh, in our community. Uh, and we wanted to continue that work through the working group. So the working group, again, represented all of those sectors that were uh, represented at the larger forum in, in late April. Uh, but we were really able to get to the heart of, I think, a lot of the issues that uh, the homeless population in Yellowknife is facing and we wanted to focus our, our recommendations primarily on uh, short and medium term solutions that we've seen work elsewhere that we know can be adapted to our local context uh, but that we all felt on the working group would make uh, an almost immediate difference in, in some of the most uh, severe uh, cases that we see on our streets. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of further discussion I'm sure following the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hike. Uh, Minister Abernathy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, just before I get going, I just wanted to uh, identify uh, two other individuals who are joining us here today. It's Susan Laramie, who's my senior advisor, as well as Kate Sill, who is the senior advisor to the uh, to the deputy minister. I don't really have much to add. I'm 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 thankful that you've uh, invited us here to have a conversation with this important topic. I'm looking forward to uh, getting some feedback, some insight, some uh, comments from you, and finding a way to to move together uh, forward. To, to address some of the challenges that we are facing here in Yellowknife and across the Northwest Territories. Uh, there is a presentation that will be made and uh, I'm open to answer any questions that uh, committee may have after we uh, go through that presentation. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Mr. Williams, I can present uh, your presentation at this point in time. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, refer to slide number two, uh, community collaboration. Uh, the Homeless Community Partnership Forum was held in Yellowknife uh, in April of 2016 at the Tree of Peace French Friendship Centre. The main objectives of the Homeless Forum was to, were to convene a range of groups to define community a uh, assets, barriers and gaps to addressing the, and mitigating homelessness and, and to identify actions to utilize available resources. Two working groups were formed out of the forum the Homelessness uh, Roadmap Working Group, a multi-stakeholder working group with goals of prioritizing options identified at the forum, identifying costing and generating an action plan to address homelessness in Yellowknife. The second working group involved NGOs who identified barriers uh, encountered by homeless uh, persons. These barriers have been brought forward to the GNWT for its review. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, the Roadmap Working Group. Uh, representatives of the Roadmap Working Group included the City of Yellowknife, the Homeless Homeful Partnership, the Yellowknife Women's Society, and the NWT Housing Corporation, representing the GNWT. Uh, the Yellowknife uh, Denny First Nation, the RCMP, and the Salvation Army. Mayor Hike chaired the meetings. The group met from uh, mid-July uh, to mid-September. Uh, the next slide, the approach. Uh, numerous uh, options came out of the homelessness forum. The working group was uh, tasked with prioritizing and paring down options into actions that meet the needs of the Yellowknife homeless population, had access to sustainable resources, had existing policy program frameworks, had a clear mandated lead agency, involved partnerships, had an achievable impact, supports community safety, contribute to our knowledge of homelessness. Options are prioritized under three priority areas. Improved coordination and collaboration, new and enhanced services, 
uh, to mitigate homelessness, long-term planning, and strategic framework development. Uh, the ne next slide. Uh, priority actions. Establishment of an interagency committee identified a need of, for frontline agencies to coordinate their activities and collaborate where possible. Explore the hub model. The hub model has been used in other Canadian communities as part of crime prevention and community safety strategies. It's structure that brings uh, frontline agencies together to address social and potentially criminal activity in collaborative settings. Uh, three, facilitate donation of goods and services. Identified a need for physical space to facilitate the donation of goods and services. Uh, four, review terms of reference of uh, CAB. Uh, recommendation to broaden memberships to include more sheltering agencies and Indigenous organizations. Um, housing first. Uh, explore opportunities for more sustainable funding. Federal funding expires 2019 and to expand the program. Number six, invest in emergency shelters, construct semi-independent units in, in excess of shelter spaces. Uh, NWT Housing Corporation partnering with the Salvation Army and Yellowknife Women's Society. Seven, street outreach services and, and sobering center. A straight safe ride program that assists individuals, often transporting them to appropriate facilities such as shelters, hospital, or potential sobering center. Eight, extension of overnight shelter hours. Uh, Department of Health and Social Services has funded Safe Harbor Day Shelter uh, to expand hours to 12 hours per day, seven days per week. Number nine, a central intake location a longer-term action that could involve a centralized intake, triage, and collection of data and information. And 10, manage the alcohol program. Recommendation of a harm reduction program involving a, a rationed amount of alcohol to individuals suffering from alcohol addiction, reduces binge drinking and consumption of non-beverage uh, alcohol. Uh, number 11, development of a 10-year plan that would provide a long-term vision and direction. Analysis of systemic issues and needs may be better defined roles and responsibilities of organizations. So that uh, concludes the, the short presentation, just an overview of what was included in, uh, in the strategy uh, in, the, in the homelessness roadmap. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, members, any have questions for... Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a lot of good work has been done here, and I think it's pretty clear um, a lot of your plans are, that are in motion are working because there's a couple of people that I know of have actually gone to treatment that lived on the streets, so it's pretty clear that uh, the actions that, that all the groups that that have come together or working, uh, you know, let's just hope that they do stay on their path. But, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that uh, all your good work is, has been uh, taken and, you know, some people are taking advantage of it. And it's good to see. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. I would take that more as a common list. It's committee of the minister, or the mayor would like to comment. Oh, Minister, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate the comments, and I think there has been a significant amount of work done around addictions, not just in Yellowknife, but in the Northwest Territories. More obviously needs to be done, uh, but I would like to encourage this committee to consider uh, going down and visiting uh, one of the facilities that we're actually contracted with, like Poundmakers. Uh, Poundmakers does a significant amount of programming for residents in the Northwest Territories. Uh, myself and uh, Mr. Natalie did have an opportunity of going down there uh, later this summer, and we actually met up with a, a number of residents from Yellowknife who had lived on the street who were taking advantage of that, that quality program, and they had a lot of really great things to say, and also they were interested in, you know, their next step as they transition back to Yellowknife, but I would strongly encourage the, uh, encourage the committee to consider going down there for a tour. Thank you, Mr. Abernathy. Mr. Bolio. 
<clears throat> Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I too am um, um, I'm support of the work that's being done. Um, I have a, cu uh, a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one is um, uh, before we go into alcohol management program, uh, uh, I, I would really like to um, the departments and, and the city to think about it very seriously. Um, uh, it appears as though all the people that I know that were on the street said are successful. Or have uh, uh, gone to um, uh, cold turkey uh, with alcohol. Uh, anybody who's tried to wean themselves off alcohol seems to never quite successfully wean themselves off. And I think that's the um, um, uh, different type of target group that has been successful uh, in uh, alcohol management. Uh, so um, I don't recommend the alcohol management for. Uh, for the uh, the uh, people uh, on the streets, the homeless people, I, uh, I think that would be a mistake. Um, the other, the other question is, um, I think once uh, individuals are going through uh, the the uh, various um, uh, processes to to get to a, uh, a place where uh, they have uh, accommodation. Uh, uh, they are able to manage the accommodation. I think uh, we need to do something about some of the, their own personal development, making work available uh, for them to uh, to continue. What's what's often happening is um, individuals are are sobering up on the street, and and like uh, the previous uh, speaker, um, uh, I've I too am currently dealing with uh, some of the successes uh, on the streets of people that I, that I know very well. Uh, but there is uh, at a point when because there's no work coming, even though. They're, they had the wish that once they sober up and they're able to get a place to stay, that the next step would be to be able to provide those services for themselves, to themselves, and um, that's not happening. So I think there needs to be some work done in the area of uh, employment development for, for these individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bullio. Uh, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and to the members' uh, point, I, we hear you loud and clear. There are certainly lots of different schools of thought on things like managed alcohol programs. I did have an opportunity to uh, to visit the Shepherds of Good Hope, which is the, the managed alcohol program, as well as a number of other programs that they deliver in that facility uh, that exists in Ottawa. Um, and. I had an opportunity to learn about their program, how they got to the program. There's a wide range of different programs out, out there. Some are day programs, some are basically residential programs. The one thing that they're very clear on is managed alcohol isn't for everybody. Um, if you're a binge drinker or a, an occasional drinker who has an alcohol problem, the managed alcohol problem program is probably not going to be the program for you because it does provide you with regular uh, allocations of alcohol. The managed alcohol program in other jurisdictions is mostly for individuals with chronic, severe addictions who can't quit cold turkey because if they were to quit cold turkey, they'd probably end up in medical distress um, very, very quickly. The managed alcohol pro program is intended to provide them with small quantities of alcohol that help them maintain an even keel so that they don't drop into that severe sort of reactionary uh, result or go out chasing other products such as um, chemicals to to ensure that they can maintain their level of intoxication. What we learned and what we what I believe is out there for everybody to learn is that it works in, in certain situations. It's a good program. It's harm reduction, uh, and that it's a transition. It can help individuals make those next steps where they can reduce and or quit alcohol enough to get into a into a treatment program. So there is a, there is a place for it. I, I hear you loud and clear. I, I hear your concerns. But I think it is still something that we we have to do our due diligence on and there is some value to it. Um, with respect to the, the other programs, the transition and the work, I think the, uh, the minister is probably in a better place than I am to speak a little bit about some of the things they're doing around housing uh, for, for residents as they're transitioning through. Uh, we're looking at providing, as was clearly articulated to us by the previous Minister of Health and, Host, Host, Health and Social Services, you might want to look in the mirror, um, made it very clear that 
people in the Northwest Territories want options, and we're trying to provide as many options as we can, recognizing that everybody's journey is going to be a little different. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Minister Cocker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to just expand um, my previous experience working for many years with homeless people. Um, I agree with the MLA um, uh, member Bolio that uh, states that uh, most people that succeed um, through are through abstinence programs. However, there is a small sect of people that are homeless actually that uh, no matter even if they are taken off all of substance, the damage that has done developmentally to their brain is actually non-repairable and so it, it's in my opinion it's really important that we try to work with those individuals and take them off of substances such as hairspray, um, mouthwash, anything that's got alcohol based and move them into a, a monitored alcohol program um, to alleviate the harm because the chemicals that they are um, t using at this point are severely damaging the brain to no recovery. So I think that is the population that we're looking at working within with the managed alcohol program. In regards to housing, we're just, uh, as all of the members know, we've just rolled out our housing survey. Um, my guess is that within this region, my guess is within this region, homelessness will still be a, a huge priority. And so my commitment was that whatever the community says was their issue would be where I was focusing my my work within housing. So if homelessness is still an issue within the Yellowknife area, which again, I, I do assume that it will be, then we will be looking at once we um, work with these individuals and get them into a more healthier spot, um, what does that look like? Um, we are supporting the Housing First initiative and that will carry on. Um, but there will come a point, hopefully, that some of those individuals will be able to be moved from a supportive housing support our housing first model into independent living and at that point we would work more intensively on on different plans with that population thank you mr chair thank you minister cocker thank you i'll just wait the, the, yeah. the, uh, go ahead oh, we're good yeah. the uh, i think the two ministers uh, <clears throat> hit on on most of the the uh, relevant points um, I would say on the, on the managed alcohol program that certainly abstinence-based programs, which have been the traditional approach in the Northwest Territories, uh, do work for a great number of people. But I also think it's quite evident when we look at the streets of Yellowknife that even the availability of those programs is not helping the entire, the entire population. And as uh, Minister Cochran alluded to, there is a segment for whom uh, they simply won't take that step. So the intention is to provide that stability where they then have the opportunity to make that healthier choice. Uh, also, in conversations with some frontline agency workers, it's it's quite clear that quite often the most violent behavior we see on the streets is as a result of the consumption of non-beverage uh, alcohol. Um, so, if we can begin to mitigate some of some of that impact as well through a managed alcohol program, I think it's something that that does need to be uh, seriously examined to see whether it would be something that would work in in the context of a place like Yellowknife. Uh, you raised the the employment issue as well. One of the the we, while we didn't hit on that in the, the Roadmap act, Action Plan itself, uh, the working group mem members were cognizant of our own limitations in terms of the time that we had to put the report together. Um, and we did want to include the final recommendation of the de development of a 10-year plan to address homelessness because we realize it is a much more uh, complex issue with, with systemic underlying uh, causes uh, that we couldn't hit on in the time we had allotted to us, but we knew that work has to happen. Uh, so, in fact, at this point, the uh, Community Advisory Board on Homelessness has developed an RFP for the development of a 10-year plan, uh, has committed funding to it, and it should be going out the door any day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mayor Hike. Uh, Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a great piece of work. I, I've already uh, said that in the Legislative Assembly. Mm -hmm. What I want to do today is, uh, is ask some questions. Uh, about implementation. So in the report itself, um, the different subject areas that correspond to the numbers here have a lead agency or agencies. Is Which of those agent, agencies are responsible for rounding up the implementation dollars for the, the different actions? And um, I'm particularly interested in actions five through, through nine. Um, so, uh, could you just confirm who's responsible for for uh, for funding or finding the money to fund these actions? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Oh, 
Or height. Thank you. Uh, the GNWT five through nine. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what's become. <laughs> Just keep kicking it upstairs. Um, I think you know one of the things that's become obvious has been obvious for a long time, but I think that we're finally starting to overcome is the need to be collaborative and cooperative uh, amongst government ag agencies, between government and non-government organizations, between all of us and the business sector. Um, and I think through some of the actions recently in terms of the, the forum in late April, the working group work that we've done, we've begun to, I think, bridge some of those disconnections that we've seen in the past. Um, so for many of these things, I think they're going to be a multi-sectoral approach, uh, even in, a, in the respect of funding. So for recommendation number five, the Housing First model, um, so far that's been a, a combination of federal homelessness partnering strategy funding along with um, funding from the, the NWT Housing Corporation. Uh, that will be the, the funding model for the foreseeable future, but uh, as was mentioned in the presentation, we've got a, a five-year, well, a, now a three-year window until the funding runs out for, for that. Uh, that could very well be renewed from the federal government, but we're not assured of that. So one of the reasons that it was included as a recommendation in here, even though it's already underway, uh, was we want to make sure it's a sustainable program and that funding is in place for the long term so that we don't get to the end of that funding time frame and have to turn around and tell 20 people that, I'm sorry, the, the funding doesn't exist for your housing anymore. Uh, for recommendation number six, this is uh, investing in emergency shelters. And this is very much, uh, you know, underway uh, as part of the 2016-2017 budget, the uh, $600,000 that the Housing Corporation announced for investments in the Salvation Army and the Center for Northern Families. So we're pleased to see that. Going forward, we think it's a, another good example of a model that seeks to plug gaps in the housing spectrum by creating that, that segment uh, towards independent or semi-independent supported living spaces that's, you know, a step above the emergency shelter cot, but uh, maybe not quite at housing first or transitional housing facility. So the initial investment is there. Uh, what that looks like three or four years down the road when the need potentially grows, we'll have to, have to see where the funding comes from there. Uh, recommendation number seven, the creation of a street outreach services program and uh, sobering center. Um, Kind of in parallel with the work of the working group, the city began meeting with Health and, Health and Social Services and Justice and the RCMP and Stanton um, to look at kind of the issue of where those major gaps were in the system in terms of calls for ambulance services and RCMP and the impact that it was having on the Stanton emergency room. And so in those discussions, we determined that uh, we would, the city itself would look at um, facilitating and taking on the, the street outreach services side of things. Um, and to that end, we've, the, the Community Advisory Board on Homelessness has already identified some funding. Uh, this committee meeting is timely because we're in the midst of our budget deliberations over at City Hall this week, so we may be talking about some additional funding coming from the city for that portion of the program. And the Sobering Center, I believe, has been the responsibility of Health and Social Services. So we're, we're in partnership towards the establishment of those, those two sides of the equation. Uh, number eight, the extension of the overnight shelter hours to close the gap in shelter hours. Uh, so again, Health and Social Services and the City have both been uh, contrib contributing to the operation of the, uh, the day shelter. Um, health has uh, taken on the, the role of negotiating the extension of the day shelter hours to cover that, that, those gaps that we saw in the, the daytime hours. Um, I will say in the, and I, I think that that was an absolutely necessary interim measure. Um, the working group did feel, though, that uh, it would be beneficial to, for the, the two overnight shelters to have a serious look at expanding their service to a 24-hour service model uh, for a number of reasons. The quality of, of service and care that can be provided to their clientele, uh, the reduced strain on clientele who are forced, you know, in the case of the Salvation Army, to kind of get outside at 6.45, 7 a.m. in the morning, potentially with weather like this. Um, the ability for, or the, the the reduction in strain that it would cause on, I think, it would result in on all facilities because really there's only one place you can be at any given hour of the day right now. Um, and if we did move to those 20, uh, 24-hour service models with the two shelters, uh, it would give, I think, the, the day shelter more opportunity to perhaps enhance its programming. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to be open for, for a 12-hour stretch, which uh, can cause some human resource issues. Um, and so that was, that's the recommendation. We're not there yet. Uh, and how we would fund that ultimately is a question that's yet to be answered. 
though the, um, the community advisory board has had some conversations. So I think it's it's a bit of a longer term goal to, to get to, uh, given that we we have a, an agreement in place to um, uh, keep the day shelter open 24 or 12 hours a day to, to fill that gap. But I think from the working group's perspective, the ideal state is to actually have facilities that are accessible 24 hours a day. And number nine, the central intake location. Uh, again, I think while that's a longer term, say one to two year uh, window for, for implementation, um, I, I think it would likely be a, a collaborative approach, probably with some federal money, potentially with uh, contributions from the territorial government, and potentially with contributions from the city. Uh, on that recommendation in particular, we, we recognized at the working group that um, the state of available housing is not such at the moment that we could actually bring people into a central locate or central intake location and guarantee them housing within a certain period of time. But we felt with the, the establishment and the potential growth for the Housing First model, uh, with the creation of these semi-independent supported living spaces, that one or perhaps two years from now we might be in position to, to uh, make that offer and have that, that one location, which would also have the added benefit of um, taking a, a fair bit of work off of the, the desks of uh, the sheltering agency we're currently tasked with much of that data collection, um, as well as improving, I think, uh, the, the quality of referral services for clients and plugging clients in with the services that may exist but they may not know about. Ms. Green? Uh, oh, sorry, Minister Abernathy, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't really have anything to add. I think the, uh, the response was comprehensive. I think the takeaway from this is that it's, it's, a, it's a real partnership working together and multiple organizations are, are seeking and, and trying to obtain funding housing, education, I mean, housing, health, and the city's also coming to the table. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Ms. Green? Oh, oh sorry, Ms. Minister, Minister Cocker. Um, I'd also be remiss if we didn't mention the federal government, even though you say it goes up. The federal government is taking a, a huge interest in housing. It's one of their huge priorities in homelessness. Um, they have not released as of yet what that will look like, but uh, we are expecting that there will be... Um, at the minimum, the same amount of funding that they've given to the city of Yellowknife for homelessness for the last four years, four years, and I'm expecting that at a minimum, um, but I am up, uh, optimistic that they will be increasing that significantly because of the pressures that the provinces and territories have been putting on the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cocker. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate the the um, comprehensive response and and I think you said that money is being um, funding is being considered in your current budget so my question is for the territorial government departments um, is there a consideration of funding uh, these actions in the next uh, O&M budget thank you thank you Ms. Green <laughs> Minister Abernathy Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I can really only talk to the two individual projects that I'm working on. With respect to the day shelter, we're not waiting till the next fiscal year to move forward. We're expanding the hours. We're doing the work immediately. Uh, it's supposed to be opening up uh, early in December. Uh, it could be as early as this week. We just need to finalize some details. Uh, and that will expand the hours in the day shelter to uh, basically 12 hours a day, seven days a week. We're not waiting. We're going to try to find it within. I think the, the city has been very generous as well. Uh, with respect to the sobering center, we are also not waiting until next fiscal year. Uh, we are hoping to to find some money from within and uh, you know pursue some money uh, through the capital through through the ONM process uh, for subsequent fiscal years. Uh, we have already done some significant planning around the sobering center. What we're looking at doing at this point in time is is opening basically a facility that'll allow. Uh, 20 men and 20 women, up to 20 men and up to 20 women who happen to be intoxicated who need to be safe, warm, sleep. We intend to have some type of uh, practitioner in there uh, to ensure that their, the health and safety of the individuals is maintained and monitored while they're sleeping within the facility. It's also an opportunity to start directing and guiding people to programs and services that may be available to them if they want to pursue a healing path. to be healthy food uh, so that they can get a healthy meal. Uh, we're basically uh, ready to go as far as program design goes. Uh, where we are having difficulty is finding a suitable and appropriate location. We are out currently looking for a location for that facility. 
Um, as I had indicated previously, we have been looking for a facility that we thought hopefully we might be able to get a better bang for your buck and have both the day shelter and the sobering shelter located in the same building, preferably with different doors because they have different intents. Um, but if we are unable to find something that meets that, 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 that desire, we will certainly have to look at two buildings. Uh, right now, we haven't been able to find an appropriate building, and we're still aggressively looking for an appropriate building. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Minister Cocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the NWT Housing Corporation, we have committed to uh, ongoing funding for the Housing First Initiative here in Yellowknife. We have also um, uh, put in this year's budget the uh, starting of three shelters in three communities outside of Yellowknife. And in our next uh, business planning, we will be putting in for the missing region, which will be the Sawtu government. So um, we will have one shelter at least in every single region of Yellow of the Northwest Territories. And uh, I am looking forward to each year um, providing more supports to address homelessness in every community in the Northwest Territories. So we're working on it, but it will take time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cock. Uh, Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the, um, the leadership in terms of uh, this initiative, um, especially for here in Yellowknife. And um, um, it's it's fairly obvious that uh, you know visibly the, the people that are marginalized in terms of being homeless are in Indigenous people. And, and I think here in Yellowknife we have the population of uh, at least of one quarter is indigenous people from all over the NBT. So, um, you know, it's it's it's. I'm, I'm I'm grateful that this initiative has gone forward in terms of addressing the homeless issue. Um, I'm just trying to understand. The minister had uh, stated very clearly that uh, you know homelessness is not only Yellowknife, but it's all over the NWT. And I just wanted to understand how this 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 could serve as a model and if there's any parallels in terms of ensuring that all 33 communities are you know receive um, at least some some support in terms of addressing the homeless homelessness issue and at the same time I understand you know there has been some 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 efforts already underway and one example is there have been pilot projects in several several communities so is there any parallels in terms of what Yellowknife is doing and plus with how the communities could move on these initiatives? Masi. Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Minister Cocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, as stated, we are recognizing that um, if we only support the major centers such as Yellowknife and Inuvik, which do have a uh, substantial shelters within those communities, um, it is the saying, if you build it, they will come. And so if we only provide the supports in the, the major centers, then we will actually increase the number of the risk is increasing the number of homeless people that come to those centers. And um, as said many times, I believe that people do better when they're closer to their natural supports, their friends and their family. So it, it is a real important for us to actually get into the communities. I do want to say um, uh, the recognition that uh, one quarter of the population that are homeless within Yellowknife are Indigenous. Um, I would beg to differ in stating that probably closer to 90 percent of the people population that are homeless within this community are Indigenous and actually not from this community. Um, on top of that. So it does say that that, um, that we need to address it in the communities. To deal with that, then there's, like I said, there's a few initiatives. We've got the three that units that will be going into communities. Uh, Clavic this year, Fort Simpson and Bechico will be having shelters this year. Um, the next business year will be one in the Saw 2 region. Um, but we're also eager to work with uh, community leaders because I think it, it does take a a uh, holistic approach. It can't only be the territorial government. So I have been approached um, in brief right now by two mayors of uh, more northern communities that actually have come forward and asked me to if I'd be interested in partnering on a tiny house model. I do have to be very careful within that. Um, for one, it would need city 
um, bylaws to be changed. Um, as the government in the Northwest Territories, I'm very bound by the National Building Code, so I'm interested in partnering with them, but it may, to define what that partnership would look like, um, is something that we're still looking at. So within the new year, in January, we will be having meetings with a couple of mayors, actually, that are looking on, on promoting things in their communities, and I think that is the right way to go. So as many communities that want to work with us and to work in partnership, then we're more than open to to that arrangement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cochran. Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, the other question that I have is that this is a very good initiative. I'm just trying to understand. You know, the, it's getting colder uh, at this very moment here. I think it's going to drop down to minus 30 before Friday. So, um, I mean, what are some of the immediate expectations that people can have in terms of addressing the homelessness issues? I mean, there's still people out there that are struggling. So, uh, I mean, what what should people expect in terms of services, or would there, there be more beds available here in Yellowknife? Um, so, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Natalie, Mr. Cocker. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Unfortunately, um, building these units will take some time. So we we know that um, we're working with the Yellowknife Women's Society, who had. Uh, found asbestos in the building that they were moving their daycare into that I believe has been resolved and so we're hoping that those units be finished by March. Salvation Army, we're still working with them. They need some paperwork signed over by the city. I think that's been um, working on at this point so hopefully we'll get those um, fairly soon. Uh, I do hate to say it but the, um, the hospital is actually opening up more so that people have a place so that they're not freezing. It is not ideal. Um, but we are committed to trying to make it work. The answer will be when we can get this sobering center open is the key. So as soon as we are working diligently on trying to find an, a suitable place, and once that is open, that will take over the overlap within the shelters at this point. Um, I know from my history before, the Yellowknife Women's Society did not turn anyone out. Um, it was only turned people out if they were very intoxicated and, and violent at that point. Um, Salvation Army is a little bit stricter within that. So, like I said, the sobering center that is staffed by qualified people will alleviate that. Um, I don't want to see another person freeze, but I do want to say that sometimes it's personal choice. The lady that um, froze last year, actually, um, I did know personally, and, and uh, I was in charge of the women's center at that time. That person was not asked to leave that person was out on the street um, on their own accord and just didn't make it to the shelter. So we may lose people that not everyone may go to a shelter or may go to the hospital or to the RCMP. Um, that is a personal choice, but I really am working hard to try to make sure that everyone has somewhere warm to sleep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cocker. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up. Um, my colleague, Ms. Green, asked some questions there. Uh, uh, one I have for the, the city. If I remember this week very fondly from my term on City Council Budget Week. is always an exciting period of time, and it might be premature, but um, I'm wondering if the mayor can sort of describe uh, in a general fashion what sort of... Uh, programs, resources the city's uh, prepared to put into this that in its upcoming budget. I think that'd be helpful for us to know. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mayor Height. Exciting is one way to put it, I suppose. Um, the, uh, yes, there's, there's several items actually related to um, to these these issues that we're talking about uh, that have already been identified um, either in past budgets and are continuing through this one uh, or may have been um, budget requests by by city council so this year's budget is actually different than um, any previous one that I've dealt with or that you probably would have dealt with uh, wherein we've got our our own M section of our budget we've got our 2017 capital section of our budget and then we've got a list of items that have been suggested by city councillors um, have been roughly costed, but are not actually included in the current bottom line. So in terms of our process, we'll go through the O&M, we'll go through the capital projects, and then we'll hit those city 
those councillor sponsored projects. So that, that should promise to be the most exciting uh, part of the week for us, I'm sure. Um, in that section, we, uh, so some of the items that we already fund, we, um, uh, we contribute $50,000 a year to the day shelter and that is, that is an ongoing commitment. Uh, we have our homelessness coordinator whose job it is to uh, administer the various funding agreements we have through the work that the Community Advisory Board on Homelessness does. Um, and we also uh, contribute the O&M cost to the side door youth drop-in centre, for example, which was a, a partnership when it first began uh, of many organizations and the city uh, actually owns the, the main side door uh, building, so we, we cover the O&M costs on that. Um, as for uh, new initiatives that have been proposed this year, um, there is uh, some discussion around um, and this relates back to uh, Mr. Bolio's question earlier about uh, a $50,000 commitment to the creation of some sort of uh, basic level employment program uh, where um, some, some you know, basic jobs, downtown Yellowknife perhaps, um, cleaning, street maintenance, that type of thing uh, could, be a, could be a possibility. So that's, that's one that's up for debate. Uh, there was some discussion around uh, enhancing our contribution to the day shelter when it was kind of in flux as to the hours. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Minister Abernathy's department has stepped up, so we can take that one out of our document. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I believe there will be a, um, a good discussion around the street outreach services. Um, we haven't identified a, a dollar figure yet, but we know roughly what that type of program costs in other places. Uh, we know how much money the, the Community Advisory Board is willing to put towards it on an annual basis, so we have a sense of, of what the shortfall might be. Um, so that'll be another item that uh, Council will dis discuss in the context of this week's deliberations. Thank you, Mayor Height. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I um, appreciate that. And uh, I should have prefaced my comments to say I think this is really good work, and I'm glad to see we've got two ministers and a mayor at, at the table. This doesn't happen very often, so I think that's a very, very good sign. Um, but I, I, I wanted to um, uh, ask uh, our uh, minister of the Housing Corp. Um, there, there's some been, and you, you alluded to this earlier, uh, that there's been recent CBC story, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be in the newspaper, maybe it was in the newspaper, about uh, that we've had to open up space in the hospital waiting areas uh, for people to uh, uh, stay overnight. Um, uh, what, what are we doing to try to address this in, in an immediate sort of crisis uh, mode um, and maybe a, a, in the longer term? I think the work that's proposed in the action plan uh, will help address that, but we're in an immediate crisis mode right now. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Cocker. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Um, the difficulty is, is the amount of time that it would take us to set up a uh, short-term emergency shelter to find the space, to find the resources, to staff it, etc., would probably take um, the same amount. In fact, it would probably take more time now because we don't have the plan in place than to actually put the resources and support the sobering center um, because it takes the same amount of work. You need to find the staff, you need to find the location, you need to find the money, et cetera. So, so the priority is to develop the sobering center, which would alleviate the um, overlap and so would deal with the capacity. So I, I know that may not be the answer that you're looking for, but at this point we're working diligently um, with Health and Social Services to, to actually get that sobering center up and running. Until then, um, we will have to count on the emergency shelter, the RCMP, and the shelters that we have in place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cochran. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, what I'm looking for uh, further to uh, my colleagues' questions is uh, an assurance that there is somewhere for everyone to sleep who wants a place to sleep through the winter. Is that, in, is that the case? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Cocker. At this point, yes. Anyone that needs a place to sleep and is willing to seek out that support um, will either be accommodated through the shelters, the RCMP, or the emergency um, at the hospital. 
uh, recognizing though that some people do not choose to access those services. And again, like I said, our priority is to get the sobering center up and running as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cocker. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I read last week and it concerned me and I, I, want, I want to ask you about this comment from the Salvation Army. Uh, they're quoted as saying that no one from the City of Yellowknife or the territorial government has approached them about s expanding their shelter. Um, and if that were the case, they would need to find a new building because there's no room at their current location and they would require additional staff. So my question is, um, what's up with the Salvation Army as far as you know? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Uh, Ms. Mayor Haig. Actually, the question should be what's up with the CBC story because it's er <laughs> clearly <laughs> erroneous. Yeah. That's what I'm asking yeah, about. yeah, no, fair enough. Um, and the Salvation Army was actually in contact with myself and I believe the Housing Corporation as well to, uh, to clarify the, the statement. Uh, so there was some misunderstanding there, obviously. So um, in the case of expanding the, the sheltering space, uh, I think there was some <clears throat> confusion between expanding emergency shelter space versus maximizing the space that they have available to them in terms of the creation of the semi-independent supported living spaces. So for the Salvation Army, that's going in on the main floor of the Bailey House. Uh, for the Center for Northern Families, once the day care program is relocated, their current space will be reconfigured. So both those things are happening and those conversations have been uh, taking place. Thank you, Mayor Haig. Mr. Bullio. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I understand that there is a home where um, uh, young, young people who would otherwise be homeless uh, live in... Um, in, I think it's like a house type of environment on Franklin, not far from the woman's shelter. Um, I was wondering if any of the uh, people at the table could uh, know anything about uh, that home. It's uh, kind of, uh, it's not real focused on teenagers, but maybe people from teenagers to people in their early 20s, perhaps. Thank you, Minister Bolio. Minister Cochran. Um, my knowledge is of the youth center um, that Hope's Haven that is actually provides supports to youth to the age of I believe it's 24 now. I think they just increased it as well. Um, I do not know of any uh, private individual that is opening up their doors, although that could be a possibility as well. But the only ones that I know of that is funded is actually the the side door that uh, Mayor Hike has talked about in the Hopes Haven for youth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cochran. Okay, Minister or Mr. Bolio. Okay, um, so it is Hopes Haven. I, I remember the name now. So, um, so they have in the. So in addition to the side door, this is another house. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for the clarification. Uh, Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just uh, want to uh, add uh, for my colleagues' benefit, Hope's Haven has both emergency and transitional housing. So like other facilities, they have one floor where people can go and stay overnight, and they have one floor of these semi-independent units where people have a room of their own where they can lock the door and leave their stuff. So they provide both kinds as the adult shelters do. Um, my, uh, my question, um, my next question has to do with um, the planning around the sobering center. I'm wondering why um, 20 men and 20 women when statistically uh, men outnumber women on the street by two or three to one. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, we were, we were recognizing that in Yellowknife there actually are a large number of females who are, are struggling with addictions issues. Uh, we fully expect that those numbers will move um, as, as we actually get into the facility and figure out what the actual demands are. But we did, we wanted to make sure that we at least had the capacity to do 20 women if we had a, a rush of individuals, women who were struggling. Uh, but we, we know we have to be flexible. We may find it's a 30-10, we might find it's a 25, uh, whatever. Um, but we feel that 40 is, is, a, is a good number to start with and an equal split to start with seemed as a, as a reasonable direction to take until we have a better sense of what the, 
the actual utilization or uptake will be. Thank you, Minister Albert. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. Um, my next question is for the mayor. I, I think there is an RFP out now for the 10-year plant and homelessness. So um, the city is taking that on through the cab, as I understand. But will it involve the other people who are at the table providing housing? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. All right. Absolutely. The, uh, the idea over there is to um, really go back to the even broader than the working group, but to really go back and talk to all of the government and agencies, all of the frontline non-governmental agencies, uh, the police, our own staff who are dealing with it, whether it's ambulance services or others, and <clears throat> very importantly, the homeless population themselves, um, because they're often a, a stakeholder that gets overlooked as we're putting these plans together. Um, so yeah, that is absolutely key to it. And, and it, as I said earlier, the idea behind that 10-year plan is really to develop something um, comprehensive and detailed and well-structured that can guide the work not only of the city and the community advisory board but all of these partner agencies who want to buy into the, the, the longer-term vision. Thank you, Mayor Hike. Any other questions for Ms. Green? Uh, I think I just have one more question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, okay. I, I wanted just to confirm that uh, the money is available to the shelters who are doing the enhanced shelter work and to the Housing First initiative, that that money is available immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Cochran. Yes, thank you. That money is available immediately. I think we are still waiting for some paperwork to be um, finalized between the city and the uh, Housing Corp. So, um, so I'd given direction to get that going, and if not, then we'll have to look at another way of, of doing that. There are some legalities that we're having difficulty with, but we're working on getting it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cochran. You. Any other questions for the witnesses? If not, I have a couple. Um, the first one, um, when you talk about uh, some of the working group, uh, homeful partnership, who is involved with that? And I guess that would be Mayor Ike, if you could answer that question. So over the uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen we've seen growing concern in the community in general around the issues of, of homelessness and, and mental health and addictions on the streets of Yellowknife, particularly downtown. Um, and certainly, the, the the business community has taken a very very keen interest in what's what's been happening. Um, so I'd say it was probably maybe a year and a half ago or so, uh, an informal group came together and and titled themselves the Homeful Partnership. So it involves um, different representatives from particularly downtown businesses uh, who had kind of concerns and saw that, you know, there was something to be offered from the private sector, whether it was, you know, potential um, uh, housing units or other goods and services that they might have available. And they've been keen to kind of contribute to solutions. So the, the working group, I think, was able to come up with um, a series of recommendations that they, that group can now look at and say, here's where we are able to contribute. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Hike. Um, I thank you. I, the working group, I think it's a good project in that. Um, it's been beneficial for the, the city only. Uh, I think the Minister of Housing said if we continue to build on this, though, we're going to have more people come in here. And I think, you know, I'm hoping at some point in time that this could be brought out to the, the community so that we don't have the influx into the community and we can help support that. So has the departments looked at potentially, uh, besides what the housing's done with the, you know, the three projects for homelessness, but have you looked at working with other communities um, in the, our is it part of the business plan right now, or are you just looking to see how well this one works? So, um, Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, we're, we're committed to providing supports for individuals struggling with addictions and addiction, addictions and mental health across the Northwest Territories and providing programs and services in communities. Um, the particular projects that we're talking about here, the, the day shelter, the expanded areas in the day shelter, the sobering center, uh, and those types of things, we, we need to roll those out uh, in Yellowknife first and see what, what lessons we can learn from them. 
uh, it may not be appropriate to have this model in every community in the Northwest Territories based on size, but there may be other communities in the Northwest Territories where this type of program would benefit. We need to we need to roll it out. We need to evaluate it. We need to see what the effects are. In the meantime, we're not going to stop working with our communities throughout the Northwest Territories. We're working on a, a mental health and addiction action plan for youth. We're working on a mental health and addictions action plan for adults uh, to find ways to enhance and bring more programs and services to the people who have clearly indicated to us that they want options uh, for their for their pathways for their for their healing journeys, and we're committed to doing that. Minister Cocker. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Minister Cocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister Abernathy, for talking about that. And in regards to housing as well, we're, we're still working on. Um, we, are hope, we are waiting for the service to come in. I'm a little bit waiting on in anticipation because it's been a long wait. Um, my, the Housing Corporation does know that, that uh, home ownership is something that I am really keen on, and I am thinking it's part of the answer. So once we get this, the survey results in, if they confirm that that is the need, then we will be doing up a long-term plan because the more people we can move into home ownership um, in consideration of the declining CMHC funding, the more people in home ownership, the more people we can get into public housing units that we can open up, and that in itself addresses homelessness because we, it's been many, many years since the territorial government has built any new units for public housing. Um, so we need to move in that direction, and I am committed to, to making sure that we do move forward in that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Cochran. Um, Minister Abernathy, you talked about evaluation. And I've been getting a little bit educated more and more in the last couple of years. Has the evaluation process been developed, or are you developing as you're moving along with this project? Because uh, I look at it, if we're going to evaluate something, if we don't have the evaluation in process or developed already, then all we're doing is evaluating what it was done. And ha so has there been an evaluation process established out there right now? Um, and I guess I'll turn that to Minister Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for, 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 for which project? Uh, There's so many projects that we're doing. Some of the projects that we have have better evaluation frameworks than the other. Uh, the deputy and myself were very committed to putting in evaluation framework so that we can make evidence-based decisions. Uh, some of these we are moving pretty fast on. There's, there's no lie. When it comes to a sobering center, uh, the demand is now. We, we, we know we need to make a move, and we're making a move. Um, we, we don't have a comprehensive evaluation framework in place uh, right now, but we are and we will develop an evaluation tool to, to help us figure out the benefits that this is providing, how we could grow, how we can become better, and how we can continue to meet our needs. But the, the reality is sometimes the evaluation frameworks are a little behind where we want them to be. Okay. Do you wish to speak on that, Minister Cocker? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in all honesty, I haven't thought about evaluating the housing at this point because we're just doing an initial territorial-wide survey um, until we get the results of the survey. I mean, our biggest... Uh, uh, the biggest focus will be on, on looking at the port programs and um, policies that we have in place. Um, once we have defined what programs we will be rolling out at that point, then we will be looking at evaluations. But it doesn't make sense to put the horse before the cart because we don't know what programs will be, um, will be coming out as a result of the survey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Walker. I do have one other question, unless somebody has an, any more questions. Do you have one more? <laughs> I know that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm asking the committee. <laughs> that's why I go to the committee. No rules in this committee. Yeah, <laughs> that's where you get asked more questions. Is there, so, any is there any other questions for Miss Green? Miss Green. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, um, once all of these uh, these pieces are in place, there'll be a full suite of responses to our homeless and intoxicated downtown. And uh, and I think that the um, the need for a central intake will become uh, the next logical point to direct people to the different kinds of services available. 
Um, is there any preliminary work going on with that? And as a part of that question, is there any possibility of linking it to the integrated case management program that Justice is running? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mayor Hike. I can uh, I can touch on it quickly. Um, under the, uh, the the first priority area, improved coordination and collaboration, we identified uh, the need for all of these frontline agencies to come together on a more regular basis. Um, we've begun discussing what the terms of reference for that interagency committee would look like, and we hope that early in the new year we can get it established and up and running. Um, at that point, I think that would be probably the most appropriate vehicle to carry the the central intake concept forward, um, given that we would have all the stakeholders at the table. So again, it's something we. We want to get up and running fairly soon, but we're all so cognizant we don't want to create an unrealistic expectation for those clients who are walking through the door that housing is going to be immediately available to them. Some communities across Canada have gotten there, Medicine Hat probably being one of the better known examples, where when you walk through the door of their central intake location, they tell you, you know, barring some extenuating circumstances, you will have housing in seven days. Um, so we're not there yet, but yeah. once I think some of these other pieces fall into place, then we'll begin to look at some of the more mid to long term uh, action items. Thank you, Mayor Hyde. Can I just add Mr. Mr. Albert, Minister Abernathy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There's a lot of talk about central intake, and you know, some people will ask, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean intake for individuals struggling for mental health and addictions who happen to have a home or don't have a home, or is it just a homeless issue? Uh, we are working on, uh, obviously, an integrated case management uh, pilot that certainly has an opportunity to work among these different areas. Uh, and I, I would like to just indicate that we actually have an evaluation framework established for this one as we are rolling it out so we know what we're evaluating so we can make evidence-based decisions. Uh, once, once that pilot is done, we'll be in a better position to have a discussion with our partners like the city, uh, but also the MLAs, uh, based on what we've learned from, from the actual rollout and the evaluation and ongoing evaluation. But it, in principle, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, and we need to run through it and, and learn our lessons so that we can make our evidence-based decisions moving forward. Thank you, Minister Abernath. Ms. Green? Uh, just one follow-up question um, to um, Glenn. Um, so how does that relate to the justice integrated case management, or it doesn't, or Thank it will? Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Green. Minister Abernathy? The, the integrated case management pilot that I'm referring to, the project that I'm working to, is actually led Department of Justice, but it involves health and social services and other stakeholders. It is the same one. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Mr. Riley. Thanks. When I look at the uh, action plan, the uh, priority that received the highest uh, weighted score from, I guess, the folks that, that helped put this together was uh, development of the 10 year plan. And uh, when I look at the uh, um, that page of the document, um, it says that the, 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 con the costs are to be determined. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, agencies uh, listed there. And, I, 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 of course, it's going to have to be developed uh, in consultation and as a, uh, in partnership with a whole bunch of uh, uh, organizations that have a say. But um, who's leading this, and do we actually have the resources to, to get it done? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Mayor Hike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, sorry, recommendation 11, development of the 10-year plan? Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, currently being led by the Community Advisory Board on Homelessness. So there's a certain multi-sectoral cross-section there already of a lot of different organizations. Um, they have identified funding and allocated funding. There was some additional funding in this fiscal year uh, provided by the Federal Homelessness Partnership Strategy. So we looked at a, a number of potential projects to allocate that funding to, and this was one of the winners. Um, so that is underway. and. Uh, if the RFP hasn't been issued, it should be any day. So. Thank you, Mayor Hyde. Mr. Riley. That's it. Thank you. My last question. Um, in regards... Why are you looking at me? Because it's <laughs> going to you. It's going to you. Um, so I've heard in the news, and Mr. Riley talked about the hospital being a place for people to stay. Has there been any concern from the staff by having to use the hospital as a place for homelessness people? Uh, Mr. Minister Abernathy. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, there are some uh, different uh, different stories out there. I was uh, updated a week or two ago that that the hospital was not going to ask homeless people to leave uh, during the day. It wasn't my understanding at that time that it was overnight stays. It has now uh, evolved into overnight stays. Uh, I got that information basically late last week, and I've been trying to get some confirmation on that, what's happening actually out at Stanton. Uh, I, I know what I hear anecdotally. We're trying to get some more information. I'll certainly provide an update to committee when I have a better sense of what's actually happening out at, out at Stanton. In the meantime, I, I don't think it changes the fact that immediate action needs to be taken. Um, and like I said, we've already got our program design outlined. We are ac actively, as we speak, trying to find the appropriate for the sobering center, which I think and I hope will take any pressure that is being inflicted upon Stanton at this point off of Stanton, but also give us an opportunity to really help people who, who need help. Uh, our first priority right now is, is finding a suitable, appropriate location as quickly as we can, recognizing that even if we found one today, we probably wouldn't be moving in tomorrow. Uh, we will have to likely do some some work to that, that, that location, but we're aggressively looking <coughs> for it as we speak. Okay, thank you, Mr. Abernathy. Um, if there's no any further comments, uh, do you wish to have any closing comments before we uh, adjourn? Uh, Minister Cocker. I just want to say i um, very grateful for the pressure and the support that uh, the regular MLAs have provided to us uh, for homelessness. I mean, it is the reason that I ran for politics was to address this issue. It's a passion of mine, um, likewise to at least one of my other members. Um, just want to say thank you very much, and you're doing your job, so keep pushing, and hopefully I'll be able to keep giving. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Hike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I really appreciate, appreciated the opportunity to, um, to come and answer questions about the Roadmap Action Plan. Um, I think some really great work was done by uh, a lot of different people in this community, uh, but what we've known and, and been saying for a long time is that you know, homelessness in Yellowknife is, is not really a problem only of this community. It's, it's got a range that's territory-wide. Um, so the opportunity to come sp and speak with, with MLAs from different regions in the territory I think is very valuable, and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation as we begin to implement some of these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hike. Mr. Abernathy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Not too much to add other than thank you so much for having us here today and, and thank you for continuing to work with us and helping us to move this important initiative forward. I'd just like to sort of outline, uh, I've been around for a couple of years now uh, and a couple of years ago when the conversation around homelessness and some of the challenges we were facing in the downtown core, everybody was saying it wasn't their responsibility. Everybody was pointing and looking at somebody else and saying, it's somebody else's responsibility, that's not my responsibility. Everybody was looking for whose responsibility it is. Today you see something different. Today you see different levels of government, different organizations, MLAs actually talking together about how can we work together and accept some responsibility to find some solutions. I'm, I'm excited by what we see, and I think there's a real, a real attitude change in Yellowknife and across the Northwest Territories in a couple of, the, couple of years on this file, and I'm excited to be part of it, and I'm, I know you're excited to be part of it. And uh, I, I say that recognizing there's still a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm excited to, to be part of this, this broad team to move forward on some of these. So thank you so much for having us here. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, the Minister and the Mayor uh, for showing up, uh, and the public servants as well. Thank you very much, and the public for coming to this meeting. So um, we'll call the meeting uh, to a close, and if the committee could wait, and we can debrief, and we can go from there. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you guys. <clears throat>